uh, I've got this one shot at you. And so uh, that last teaching, uh, I, I love it. I love it. I, I think it's so simple to see how a local church uh, uh, should function, can function. And uh, what we're going to look at now in Second Chronicles chapter 9, I'm, I'm going to show you a first-time visitor in the Bible, okay? Now, the reason I'm, going, I'm doing this, in my travels, uh, I will go to a church and they will tell me that they have a lot of visitors. Brother Buddy, we don't lack for visitors. Tell you the truth, if all of our visitors stayed, we'd be five, six, seven times bigger than what we are right now, but a lot of them don't come back. And then they'll tell me why they think the visitors don't return, or really what, why they think the church isn't growing. They'll say, Brother Buddy, you know, we have a lot of visitors, a lot of visitors, but they don't come back, and when you meet our pastors, you'll understand why. I don't know how many times I've been told this. If they didn't dress the way they dress, if they didn't act the way they act, if they didn't teach the way they teach, we know, we know more of our visitors would come back to the church. And I tell these people, I said, listen, what you just said is not true. It is a proven fact that the first person you need meet in a new location, that's the person that influences you the most if you return or not. I said, let's go back out into your parking lot. Let's get out of your visitor's car. Let's come into your church. Go everywhere a visitor might go. Talk to everybody they might talk to before they ever see, ever hear the pastor of your church. And we'll probably come up with 10 or 12 reasons why they didn't come back. <laughs> and have names for each one of them. <laughs> Look your neighbor, smile, and say he's talking about other churches. <laughs> Because a lot of times, the first person that somebody meets in a church is old brother Sam out in the parking lot. Amen. Just park it over there. Stay between the lines. Grab those kids' hands. We need three-foot speed bumps out here. Nursery? I don't know where the nursery's at. Find somebody who's got a baby and follow them. <laughs> now, who's old brother Sam? Well, old brother Sam used to be an usher. He used to work in the sanctuary, but old brother Sam was, he, he was rough with people. So what are we going to do with old brother Sam? We're going to put him in the parking lot. There's just cars out there. You're laughing because you've met old brother Sam, haven't you? I've met hundreds of old brother Sams. Drive in on a church parking lot, and they look at you like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here, you know? Or they totally ignore you. Look at your neighbor and say, other churches. Other. <laughs> Amen. So I have people ask me at times, Brother Bell, where, where do you get all this stuff at? You need to travel with me. It's everywhere. Amen. <laughs> it's everywhere. Second Chronicles chapter 9. Let me show you a first time visitor in the Bible. I believe we can relate this to the local church today and maybe, you know, help you to understand, number one, your pastors a little bit better, why they want things done a certain way, okay? It's not just because, you know, they're, they're, they're picky, you know, Pastor Hart, he's really picky, you know, everything's got to be da 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 you know. Well, I'm going to help you out with that, amen. It says that when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Pastor Art and Joanna, she came to prove Pastor Art and, and Joanna with hard questions at, where, where, where am I anyhow? Yeah, California, amen. <laughs> <laughs> with a very great company and camels that bear spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. Now, this lady is loaded. She carries it around on camels, okay? How many of you ladies would love to have a camel loaded down with jewels and precious stones? Amen. My wife wants a double hump camel, amen. <laughs> and when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions, and there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not. Now, verse 3. And when the queen of Sheba had seen, now... 
I want to key in on that little word, seen, S-E-E-N, sight. Now, I realize and understand that all of you that are present here today, that we are spirit people. All you that are watching online, that you are spirit people, okay? And we're not moved by what we see or hear or smell or taste. But I've often said this, if we're not supposed to use them, then why did God give them to us? I thank God my nose was working when I picked up that glass of sour milk. And if my nose wasn't working, I thank God my tongue was working. Because if my nose wasn't working and my tongue wasn't working, my stomach will work. <laughs> and we'll bring it up and start all over again. Amen. But what I want to bring out before we continue, there are those who are moved by what they see. And the majority of the time, it is our first-time visitors who are moved by what they see. So, the Queen of Sheba, this is her first visit with Solomon. Let's take note of what she's going to notice, and we'll see how it affected her. Okay? It says, and when the Queen of Sheba had seen, number one, the wisdom of Solomon. You can see wisdom. The way things are managed, the way things are handled, taken care of. She saw the wisdom of Solomon. Next, she noticed the house that he had built. Hmm. Now, th that's interesting. That you ladies notice buildings. You notice the decor on the outside and even on the inside. And it affects you in a different way that affects me, a man. There is a difference. Some argue the point, but there is a difference. Amen. You like the, 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 the mauves and the teals and the plants and the flowers. Us men, <laughs> just give us a, whatever this is. Amen. A block of, of plastic, amen, and we'll preach. Amen. I was with a pastor in Chicago, Illinois, uh, many years ago, uh, ran a fairly, fairly large church. And uh, we were talking one afternoon in his office about uh, church growth. And he brought out two very interesting uh, statements. He said, buddy, wouldn't you agree that the majority of the congregations that you have ministered to so far, that there are more women than men in those congregations? I, said, yeah, I thought about it. I thought, yeah, that, that, that's true. And wouldn't you agree that the majority of the buildings that you've preached in so far that on the outside and even on, on the inside, they have a very masculine look and feel to them. And I, and I was thinking about one church I walked in and had wood floor, wood pews, and, and, and it was just, I thought, man, I'm going to have to really plow through this. I mean, he says, you know, if you're not relaxed, if you're not comfortable, if you're not at peace, the odds are you're not going to bring someone else into that same atmosphere with you. She noticed the house that he had built. You know, I, I tell pastors, if you have some dirt outside, some don't, but if you do have dirt outside, plant something in it. Put some life on the outside of your church. So when people drive by, if they see life on the outside, they'll start thinking, maybe, maybe there's life on the inside. inside. Now, I'm not a hard person, okay? All right? But I've driven by some churches and, 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 and again, I'm not a hard person. And I've said to myself, they'd have to pay me to go in there. And a lot of them do. Amen. <laughs> Amen. They, just, they, just, they look dead on the outside. And, and, and you, you know, now you know what I'm talking about. You've got them here in, in, in this area right here. You drive by, you wonder if they're still open or not. And, and I realize some churches don't have dirt outside. Well, you know, you need to throw up a banner every now and then. Okay? Just let people know something's happening in there. You know, I had a realtor tell me, uh, Brother Buddy, if you've got any extra money, uh, uh, put it on the outside of your house and not on the inside. Because if people drive by, if they don't like what they see on the outside, the odds are they're not going to pick up the phone to find out what's on the inside. She noticed... The house that he built. First time visitor. Now, experts say, whoever they are, 
that a new family within the first six minutes when they come onto your property will determine if they're going to return or not. First six minutes. Who do they meet in the first six minutes? Now you're going to hear this out of me, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in this. I do not believe in just picking anybody to be a greeter or an usher. I'm not. I am not. I just, hey, uh, uh, Brother Larry, you come help us take the offering? You know, and he walks up acting like, well, I'm not going to give anything anyhow. <laughs> Amen. And then I've watched greeters at the door only shake hands and greet certain people that walk in. Won't greet everybody. Just people they know. Look your neighbor. Other churches. Other churches. All right. She noticed the house that he had built. Next, she noticed the meat of his table. I thought that was interesting, Pastor Art. I don't believe there were tables set up with just meat on it. I believe there were other things on the table. But she noticed the meat. I believe she noticed the quality that he had. How well he fed people. Amen. You ever had anybody ask you, what's your pastor preach on Sunday morning? You you know why they ask you that question? They're looking for meat. Because where they've been going or have been going to, all they got was milk. Milk don't satisfy you. You got to have a steak every now and then. Amen. Amen. But we think if we tell them about the steak that my pastor serves on Sunday morning, it'll scare them off. So we think of some milk dish he dished up one time, and then you wonder why they don't come. Listen, if they're looking for meat, tell them, you need to come to our church. Amen. Because our pastor serves steak and a baked potato, green beans, apple pie a la mo, and Oklahoma sweet tea. Amen. What time is it? We got to get out of here. Amen. She noticed the meat of his table. First time visitor. Okay. Let's go on. And the sitting of his servants. Well, there are people that come to this place. That's not a used car lot out there. You know, first time visitors knows how many people don't come to your church. Okay, brother buddy. How would a first time visitor know how many people don't come to our church if this is their first time here? Let me explain. Every chair in this auditorium represents a person. Amen. A visitor shows up. Why? Because they've been told how great your church is. Okay? Now, I'm a firm believer the number one evangelism tool is curiosity. It's curiosity. You know, some people, uh, Brother Bell, it's so hard to get people to come to church. You know what you just told me when you say that to me? You don't talk about your church outside of the four walls. It's not hard to get people to come to church. All you got to do is just talk about church. You don't have to preach to people. You don't have to quote scripture to them. You don't have to act spiritual around them. Just talk about your church. Talk about what, what, what goes on. What the church has done. Just talk about the church. And sooner or later that curiosity is going to peak. And they're going to want to come and see. And then they walk in and half of the people are not here. Oh no brother buddy we're all here. No. Now I'm not a hard person okay. I'm not. I'll go to a church that runs a hundred on Sunday morning. They got an auditorium that'll hold 500 chairs. So in faith, they go out and buy 400 extra chairs. In faith. Now, I'm not against going out and buying 400 faith chairs. But I tell pastors, you need to take those faith chairs, go put them in a faith room, and when Mr. and Mrs. Faith shows up, go get them a faith chair. Amen. If you want to create excitement in your church, bring chairs out. I... um. Um, I forget the word. Uh, 
I went, uh, I didn't work for him, I didn't go on, I uh, consulted, yeah, consulted a large church in Tulsa. And the pastor was real concerned about growth because a lot of his friends, their churches were growing and he was real concerned about it. And so I did something. I told this one, one guy that, was, that worked there, I said, I want you to do something for me. I said, but don't tell anybody what we've done. I said, I'm gonna prove something here. I said, I want you to take the back three rows in the, in the sanctuary, I want you to take the chairs out. Go put them up wherever you put chairs. I said, but don't tell nobody. This is gospel truth. Within two weeks, there was a rumor going through the church that the church was growing. Why? Because they didn't see the empty chairs when they walked in. There were people sitting in those chairs. Amen. Pastors, I, I, prove me wrong. Take some chairs out. I would rather... The testimony after church was church was full instead of half full. And I can make that testimony really easy. I'll just take out the chairs that you don't use. And nothing says you can't bring them back. Now, if you have pews, I understand. You can ruin a lot of, a lot of ushers that way, taking pews out. <laughs> Buddy Bell's in our church, you know. <laughs> Got to bring pews in and out. But I understand that, okay? But prove me wrong. Take, take the chairs out and see what happens. Listen to what people are saying. Oh, man, we were full. They're not, they're not going to ask how many chairs were, were in there or how many you got in another room somewhere. They see that church was full. So something must be happening in this church because they're full. You know, years ago, the old saying was, build it and they'll come. And they forget, yeah, build it and you'll pay for it until they come. Yeah. <laughs> and I have an amen. amen. She noticed the sitting of his servants. First time visitor. She's looking this place over. Let's go on. And the attendance of his ministers. Hmm. That's interesting. She noticed the sitting of the servants, but she noticed the attendance of the ministers. Now, I'm a firm believer that leaders in a church should never sit, sit past the second row in a church. I'm a firm believer in that. Why? How can you lead someone when you sit behind them? I don't have a lot of education, but I have learned some things. I've learned that when you lead, that means you are in front. Why do leaders sit in the back of their church? There's a reason. There's always a reason for everything. A few years ago, many years ago, I went out to find out why do leaders sit in the back of their church? Well, I found out why. They don't want the people to see that they don't go along with the pastor no more. So they sit in the back, and so they can. I think they're just telling you they don't want to be a leader no more. Amen. People never go beyond their leadership. However the leadership is in the church, <clears throat> I'm just not talking about the pastor and his wife or... Uh, if they're not faithful, if they're not committed, if they're not excited, I can guarantee you this, the people that are under them will not be faithful, will not be committed, and will not be excited. Now, I'm going to take a little liberty here. And, and I'm not saying I am the spokesman for the Ministry of Helps, but I, I don't know how many times I've been asked to say this. We in the Ministry of Helps, we're tired of taking the blame. You don't come, why should we come? You're not excited about what's going on, why should we be excited about what's going on? You don't give, why should we give? We, in the Ministry of Helps, we're tired of taking the blame. Amen. 
People never go beyond their leadership. Aren't you glad you're on the second row? <laughs> Moving right along, I wish you would, brother buddy. I'm not feeling a lot of love right now. And the attendance of his ministers and their apparel. Whoa, what time is it? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to skip apparel. I mean, we can skip parts of the Bible, right? No, you can't. But what's apparel? Clothing. Ooh, she noticed what they were wearing. Well, you know, brother, buddy, maybe somebody ought to tell her that God don't look at the outward. He looks at the inward. And you know what, dear saints? I am fed up to hear hearing that. Because I only hear that from uncommitted, undisciplined, sloppy Christians. You say, now, brother, buddy, you're, you're getting ready to step out on some thin ice right now. I know I'm getting ready to step on some thin ice. And this is what I'm going to do when I get out there. I'm going to bust it. Amen. <laughs> Every now and then you hit a nerve. Amen. <laughs> She noticed their apparel. Now, I think we ought to give their best. Give your best. Amen. But also, I think they're talking about an attitude also. What is your attitude on Sunday morning when you wake up? You know. You know you're going to be serving in the house of God. What is your attitude when you come to your clothes closet? Do you come open the door and go, well, it's clean. That is a careless attitude. And I thank God that he doesn't have a careless attitude with me. Again, I think we ought to give God our best. Amen. Amen. But now listen to me. Don't turn me off, man. I, I know I'm, I'm hitting nerves right now. You know why? Because whenever I talk about this in California, you know what I'm told? Brother, buddy, this is California. And I say... This is the Bible. So who are you going to go with? California or the Bible? Start the car. <laughs> but now, <laughs> I love teaching this in California. I love it. Listen to me. Your best and my best might not cost the same amount, okay? Your best and my best might not be made out of the same material. But one thing about it, when we're serving together in the house of God, we can look at each other and say we are giving God our best. Amen. Amen. And let me say this, okay? I, I have nothing against casual, okay? But there's two types of casual. There's a nice casual, and then there's a sloppy casual. Amen. I've gone to churches, and after the service, I'll come to the pastor and say, Oh, you hire those people on your platform, right? Well, why'd you ask that, brother, buddy? Because they don't look like they belong here. They don't dress like you dress. So you must hire those people from the outside. And then I'm this close. How close is that? I, I'm this close. Going up to a worship team and asking them, who are you mad at? What are you so upset about? You stand up here for a half an hour singing songs about Jesus and you can't even smile. Who are you mad at? What are you so upset about? Well, brother, buddy, you wouldn't believe what I'm going through. Oh, man, I believe it. I had to look at it for over a half an hour. Who are you mad at? Excuse me. There's some things I just got to get off my chest. Y'all don't travel like I travel. I go to churches, I look up in the choir, and there's gloom, doom, and despair. I tell gloom, doom, and despair to sit down. Amen. 
These people have been going through the valley all week and they don't need to come in and be reminded that they're still in the valley. Well, you know, it, 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 it's hard to smile. Well, do it by faith. It's supposed to be faith, people. Do it by faith. Excuse me, I just had to get that off my chest. You're going to get the same way, Jim. <laughs> Amen. She noticed there a peril. Amen. Now, I like what Pastor Art did to me. When, I, when he called me and asked me to come, and, and I said I would come, he says, now you're going to wear a suit and tie on Sunday morning. I like that. I was going to wear one anyhow. I've been wearing one, you know. But, you know, hey, I know a guy that runs 40,000 people on Sunday morning. And if he would just put a T-shirt on and some uh, knockout knee t- uh, uh, tennis shoes, uh, uh, yeah, tennis shoes and blue jeans, he'd probably run more than 40,000. But the guy wears a suit. Can you believe it? And he runs 40,000 people. Yeah, so don't come, come at me with that other. Well, I'm just trying to relate. No, you're sloppy. <laughs> Amen. And, 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 you know, again, I believe there's a nice casual and then there's a sloppy casual. Amen. And I, I've seen a nice casual. Actually, I got it on right now, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and I was at Derek Prince's church in Florida. And they were getting to remodel, and, and they asked me, do you think we should remodel? And the reason they asked me that is because the area that the church was in was beginning to go downhill. And they felt that maybe they shouldn't remodel. I said, oh, no, you want to remodel. I said, those people, when they walk into your church, it gives them hope that things could be better. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's go on. I'm almost done here. First time visitor. And she noticed his cupbearers also and their apparel. Now she's really looking this place over. You know, I often tell pastors, if your offerings are down, you need to watch your ushers. Your ushers are influencing the giving in your church. You know, pastor gets up and says, all right, it's offering time. God loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious giver. Then your ushers come down the aisle. You think good night? The casket must be right behind them. I don't want to put anything in the bucket. Probably going to take it out back and bury it somewhere. If God loves a cheerful giver, then God loves a cheerful picker upper. You've got a question. Well, brother, buddy, why, why aren't they much you smiling? Why aren't they happy? I'll tell you why. They're not givers themselves. I would never have a non-tithing usher. What an honor to stand up and say, we're getting ready to pick up your tithes. I want you to know these people here that are getting ready to serve you uh, are tithers in our church. Wow. One usher said, you better not look at the books to see if I'm a tither or not. I said, relax. I said, we don't have to look at the books. Sheep are not dumb. We have our ways of finding out if you're a tither or not. When we're at IHOP, right before we eat our pancake, we'll bring up tithing and notice how fast you dig into your pancake. (laughs) And you serve in the church. And you don't tithe. (sighs) Moving right along. And his accent by which he went up into the house of the Lord. And there was no more spirit in her. 85% of communication is done through body expression. Another word there for spirit, she was breathless. She walks into this place. She sees the wisdom of Solomon. 
the house that he built, the meat of his table, the sitting of his servants, the attendance of his ministers and their apparel, the cupbearers and their apparel, the way he carried him up, himself up into the house of the Lord. She was breathless. I wouldn't be surprised if she might have had a thought. And I've heard this thought before. You know, it's like stepping into another world. Do you know there's people out there in that world out there that's looking for another world, a better world? Do you know there is a better world? But a lot of people don't know when they step from one into the other. See, I don't, where we've got this, that we've got to be like them, dress like them, act like them to win them. We need to show them something better for their life. Amen? Amen? Let's go on. And she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land of thine acts and of thy wisdom. Uh Uh-oh. Somebody was talking outside of the four walls. Howbeit I believe not their words until I came and my what? Eyes has seen it. And behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceedeth the fame that I heard. You mean there was something else that affected her just as much as everything else that she's already noticed? Yeah, look, she says, happy! Or the next verse. Next verse. Happy are thy men, and happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, the hear thy wisdom. Everybody was happy. Everywhere she went, everybody was happy. The spirit of the place affected her also. She didn't get yelled, out, yelled at in the parking lot because she didn't park between the lines. She wasn't ignored at the door when she walked in. She didn't get a lecture from the nursery worker when she went to the nursery. You know, I hope you brought some extra diapers. You need to tell them out there I need some help back here. Oh, man, I've heard that so many times. She didn't walk into the sanctuary and the ushers look at her like, what are you doing here? No, when she met the parking lot guy, he had a smile on his face. He welcomed her. When she came to the door, the greeters had a smile and they welcomed her. When she walked down to the nursery, the nursery worker, you know, explained to her how we're going to take care of your baby and, 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 and just know that she's being well taken care of while you're up here in the Word of God. She walks into the sanctuary. The ushers realize she's new here. So they find her a good seat up front where she can hear and see everything. The worship team's already decided what they're going to sing. Amen. And they're all smiling when they sing. Amen. I'll never forget the, nurse, the, the mother who came to the nursery worker after a service and said, I want to know what you did to my baby last week. What do you mean? Well, when I got my little one, I took her home. I put her in her bed, and she went to sleep immediately. She never goes to sleep immediately. What did you do to my little baby? And just for a brief moment, The nursery worker shared with her about Jesus. The mother came out, I'll never forget it, came out, pastor gave an altar call, she raised her hand, and she received Jesus. Now, was it the sermon? No. It was that nursery worker that affected her, influenced her. We're in this together. Amen. Let's, Let's go on, let's go on. She, 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 she said, blessed be the Lord thy God. She got saved. Now, I know nobody gets saved in the Old Testament, but it's type in the shadow of a new. She says, there is a God. I don't believe an unsaved person should have to go to church four or five times to realize that there is a God. She said, blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on his throne to be king for the Lord thy God. Because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever, therefore made he king over them, do judgment and justice. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and spices of great abundance and precious stones, and neither was there any such spice as the queen of Sheba gave, gave King Solomon. She pulled out her checkbook. And wrote a check for $120 million and dropped it in the bucket when it went by. Now, pastors, I don't know. Maybe all your buildings are paid off. 
you've got thousands and thousands in the bank, but if you don't, I know where you can get some. From your first time visitors. There's no telling how many Queen of Sheba's have been to your church. They could write you one check, not even blink. Amen. You say, Brother Buddy, you after people's money? No, no, no. Relax, relax. I'm not after people's money. But if they have it. <laughs> I can't think of a better place to put it than in your church. Can I have an amen? amen? This morning I gave you a definition for the ministry of helps. Do any of you remember the first word of that definition? Oh. Yeah, I'm going to have to stay another week. Amen. <laughs> that sounded like pain to me. <laughs> Sound like deliverance, didn't it? <laughs> Amen. Brother God Bay starts off excited. He starts off, oh, the infinite value of the humble gospel helpers. Thousands of people have no gifts as leaders are number one helpers. How grand, interesting word, grand. How grand revival work moves along. When? When red to hot platoons of fire baptized helpers crowd around God's heroic leaders of the embattled host. Would you stand up with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Were you challenged just a little bit? Are you taking a little closer look at, at your church, at the people that are serving? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for tonight. And Father, I thank you for all the ministries that were represented here tonight. I thank you for the individuals that are represented here tonight. Holy Spirit, you've challenged us. The word says, provoke the brethren unto love and unto good works. And we've been provoked tonight. And we desire to be the church that you've called us to be. And Father, I thank you for this. I thank you for the anointings that you placed upon our lives. I thank you for the gifts that are stirring, are going to rise to the top. And they're going to be all that you want them to be. And Father, I thank you for this. And Father, I, I thank you for the days ahead, the weeks ahead, the months ahead, that we continue to, to realize that you are our Lord and our Savior, and that you are the one who supplies all of our needs. You've never failed us, and I don't believe you're going to start failing us. And Father, I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, and we all said amen and amen. Now, before you sit down, I want you to turn to two people. Everybody say one, one. Two. two. I want you to turn to two people one at a time. I want you to throw your arms around and give them a hug and go, oh, and you can be seated. <laughs>